Yes. Okay. Me, 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 me. Okay. How you doing, guys? How you doing? I, lo I, I don't like my shoulders, man. All right. Got to get in fighting shape by the grace of Jesus Christ. Whenever you, if possible, without spending any time, just so plain. No. No miracles in the name of Moses. Not in the Hebrew scriptures. Nope. Sorry about that, just being distracted. How you guys doing? Uh, long day again. I'm just uh sorry about that getting distracted. Yep, yep. Sorry about that, folks. You know, I get asked, this again shows that people don't pay attention too clearly. Here's why. Um, anytime I mention Muhammad, I spell prophet as P-R-O-F-I-T. P-R-O-F-I-T. And then people say, hey, brother, you misspelled it. It's P-R-O-P-H-E-T. No. I'm deliberately spelling it prophet because he's no true prophet, P-R-O-P-H-E-T. So I don't know when the Christians and the Muslims are going to get it. He is a prophet, P-R-O-F-I-T. He's not a prophet, P-R-O-P-H-E-T. So people say, hey, you're misspelled. No, I'm not. Come on now. Don't you get it? Why would I call him a prophet? He's not. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but anyway, anyway, pray by the grace of Jesus Christ will be a session anointed by the Spirit that will be filled with the Spirit that Jesus Christ, our God and Savior, will cover us by his precious holy blood. Wash us in the blood of Jesus. Purify us in the blood of Jesus. Save us from our own flesh, our own imperfections, our carnal desires to mortify our flesh by the power of the Holy Spirit. Walk in the life of the Spirit. Be filled with the fruit of the Spirit for the glory of Jesus. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Abba, we ask in Jesus' name that you be with us, not just during the sessions, but that you guide us and strengthen us by your Spirit every second, every minute, every hour of our earthly lives, empowering us by your Spirit to be in love with you, to be in love with the Lord Jesus Christ, to be in love with the Spirit himself. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, Father, living for you in obedience, in purity, in holiness, in righteousness, in love, and compassion, and mercy, as well as boldness. Make us bold as lions, Father. Make us warriors, spiritually and physically, like David and his fighting men, Father. And save us from the evil one. Save us from the world. And the children of Satan, the children of this world, Father, shield us not to be afraid. Destroy our fears and doubts, our unbelief. And make us more like your son, the Lord Jesus, in love, in holiness, in purity, in worship, in devotion, in service. And seal us by your spirit to be in love with each other, members of the body of Jesus Christ, for the sake of our Lord Jesus. Because Jesus said, by this they shall know that you are my disciples, your love for one another. Help me in that area, Father, to be more patient with my brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ and save me from my imperfections, save me from being unnecessarily offensive and save me from my weaknesses, Father. And bless everyone here that by your spirit, I will bless them, fill them, fill me with knowledge and wisdom and insight from your spirit and the power of your spirit to live your word perfectly, to love your word, proclaim it and even die for it if necessary, Father. And even though the dogs of Satan bark, silence their their barks muzzle them by the power of the Holy Spirit and make us fearless warriors for your glory, for the glory of Jesus, filled with your spirit, Lord. Be with us, Father. <clears throat> Cover us with the blood of Jesus. Cover our loved ones, my daughters, with the blood of Jesus. Cleanse them, purify them in the blood of Jesus. Seal them, seal us, our loved ones, by your spirit. Enable me to recall and interpret scripture correctly and perfectly and save me from stammering and confusion. And bless the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants. And fill my lungs and my chest and my throat with the breath of life. 
the, the health from the Spirit to do this for your glory. We need you, Father. We need you, Lord Jesus. We need you, Holy Spirit. Please save us for your glory in Jesus' name. Yahovah. Yahovah Rapha, Yahovah Rapha, Yahovah Rapha, Father, Son, and Spirit, in Jesus' name. All right. I wanted to start around 1 p.m. I forgot what time zone I'm in, 1 p.m. That would be a uh, Protestant. What time is it in your neck of the woods? What time is it in your neck of the woods? Hopefully we get about 200 again in Jesus' name. Okay. Yeah, I was going to start at 2 p.m. Central Standard Time, which was 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, New York Time, which was one my time. But Christian Prince was doing a live stream, and I wanted to wait for him to finish. So I'm sorry I'm a little late. Hold on a second. Sorry, we're a little late. Right. So let's focus and glorify Jesus, right? May the Lord spray me from stammering and beatify me with the beauty of Christ. Right, just yeah, because sometimes, depending on what I've eaten, my lisp gets very bad. Yeah, he streamed, but then it crashed. Uh, just what 20 minutes ago, he lost connection. When I say crashed, he lost internet connection. So it's my time to begin. Okay, I was asked a question. What's uh, was it even Vine? Yeah, I think Vine asked me. Andrew Martin asked me a question about the sons of God. Specifically in Job chapter 1, I had a commenter also ask me about the sons of God in Job chapter 1, verse 6, Job chapter 2, verse 1, and Genesis chapter 6, verses 2 and 4. And then Vine asked me about the sons of God, son of God. Isn't it interesting? I got three individuals asking me a similar question about the term son of God, especially how it's defined in the Hebrew scriptures. So that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to discuss the term Son of God specifically in Genesis chapter 6, verses 2 and 4. So write these down. Genesis 6, verses 2 and 4. Job chapter 1, verse 6. Job chapter 2, verse 1. Job chapter 38, verse 7. You see now you have a Mohammedan who is a filthy dog who speaks the language of the Quran. And he just called me his mother's pet name, Persian Gaming. This is the same dog that was on my YouTube page challenging me to debate on Christ, but he's too much of a dog to debate. He'd rather do muta and call me his mother's pet name, right? It's, it's, it's uh, amazing that these Muslims are now unveiling their true colors, right? And they're not able to hide their demonization. The same demons that pricked their prophet and filled him and made him a woman raping, prostituting, <clears throat> murderer. You see that now manifesting through them, right? Specifically, Muhammad Hijab, whom Christian pr Prince put a niqab on. Him and his... Uh... Hey, sorry about that. You know, it's ironic. I'm actually in Child of God's home, and this is the first time his internet buffered on me, Right? Am I coming in clear? But anyway, they're starting to manifest. They're manifesting. They're exemplifying the spirit of their prophet and shaming him for the world to see. Glory to Jesus Christ. May Jesus continue to shame them, humiliate them unto repentance, and expose Muhammad for the son of Satan that he was. Right? Okay, anyway. Friend, why, why would you be that stupid to say, well, Christian prince debate Mufti Abu Layth? He'll debate any Muslim, and he will shish kebab them and barbecue them like <clears throat> Jesus <clears throat> pretty much barbecued Muhammad in hell. Anyway, guys, let's focus. I don't want any children of Satan distracting us as the blood of Jesus Christ covers us. So, <clears throat> admins, if you see the Muhammadans manifesting, send them. Back to Asheron. Right. Yeah, so. Anyway. Let's focus now, because I want to focus, and we're over. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Why am I buffering, man? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yep. Hey, man, that's interesting. His, uh, his uh, internet's buffering. I wonder why. Anyway, let's see if it's going to act up again. I don't know. What's that noise? You hear something, guys? Hmm. Okay. Let's see if it's going to work. All right. What does the term son of God mean? Are, you, are we ready now? Yeah, but it's usually here doesn't lag. I don't get, you know, buffering. Hmm, something's out there. I don't know. Everything clear? Can you hear something? Where's that noise coming from? Hmm. It's coming from my computer. I wonder why. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I think, yeah, I think what's happening is my computer is trying to cool down. Yeah. I don't know what that means. That's too close for comfort, my face. Hmm. No, it's not the router. It's my computer. It's my. It's starting to, I think, cool down. It's like I can hear it. Hmm. All right. Like water, my friend. Really not much I can do about it. Is it going to disturb you guys? Is it going to disturb you? You guys are going to be okay with it? I don't know what you mean by the son of God extent the child of God. You're may, that's a distinction without a difference. Because what would the term be for son of God in the Hebrew and the Greek? And the term son of God would be used inclusively for males and females. So is it going to disturb you guys are okay? I don't know what the no okay means. They say, yeah, okay. It's okay because it's for you guys. If I restart, then I lose the live stream. So if I restart, I lose the live stream. So you want me to restart? Okay, let's restart, folks. Hold on. Let me restart. Let me restart. Yeah, let me restart because that's what PJ told me to do. Yeah. Hold on. Okay. Okay, once I restart, I lose the live stream. That means this here, I lose. Then I got to delete this and start it over again. So, Philip Ryan, are, are you sure you want me to restart? How sure are you? Hold on. We're wasting time here, yeah. Can I want? Can I ask someone why is Acts 7, 20, 17, 23 Keep asking me how my children is when I'm in the midst of a topic. Okay, okay. Let's focus, guys. Let's pray against distractions because you see we're not starting off too good, right? We're not starting off too good. We're getting distracted again, which usually is a good sign. When we get attacked and we get distracted, that means usually means the enemy is upset. Glory to Jesus Christ. As long as the Holy Spirit is not upset, we're covered by the blood of Jesus and sealed and filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You see, the dogs of Satan, the dogs of Muhammad are, not, are out. Mr. Cab Black. Okay, I'm going to call you out. I just challenged him to debate me on your prophet whoring women like your mother in the name of Allah. So, Mr. Cab Black, before I begin... Is it okay for a Muslim to marry a woman for three days, give her money, and then divorce her? Would you be okay with a man sleeping with your mother if your father is dead for three days and paying her money and divorcing her? Is that okay, Mr. Kab? Let's see if Muhammad Hijab destroyed me or whether Jesus buried Muhammad in hell. No, I didn't, I didn't ask you that. I said, is it okay? I didn't say what you agree with. Is it okay? Are you okay with a man marrying your mother if your father is dead for three days, sleeping with her, and then giving her money and divorcing her? Would you be okay with that, Mr. K Mr. Cam? Let him answer, folks. Don't answer for him. Just let him answer. 
Let's see who destroys who. Uh, I'm not the one who spoke with the young girl. It's Christian Prince. And Christian Prince actually just addressed it in his live stream. Because you Mohammedans follow the spirit of your prophet, your liars. You didn't quote where she insulted Jesus and his mother. But are you going to answer the question? Or are you going to be like your prophet who doesn't answer but only murders people and rapes their wives? So are you going to answer? Or are you going to be like your prophet? You murder people and then rape their wives. Let's try this real quickly. Let's see if I'm wasting time with another stone stone kisser. Let's see. I didn't ask you, with, would you agree with it? Are you okay if someone did it with your mother, if your father's dead and he did muta with her for three days and gave her money? If you're not okay with it, why not? Tell us why you're not okay with it. Tell us why you're not okay with it. How are you doing, Muhammad Faridi? I know you need attention, Muhammad Faridi, but it's okay. Just be patient. So I didn't ask you whether it's a Shia practice. Why are you not okay with it? Why don't you accept it? Why don't you agree and accept it? Why are you not okay with it, Mr. Cam Black? The answer is in my response, you Muhammad. So you just called me Muhammad. You see what he said? I'm not Muhammad. So don't call me Muhammad. Don't call me by your prophet's name. One more time. Why in your response do you say you don't agree with Muta? Why? Why don't you agree with Muta? You're wasting our time. Why don't you agree with Muta? We're waiting. See, they can't answer. They're ashamed of their prophet. So like their prophet, they can only murder men and rape their women. See, that's all they can do. They talk tough, and they're tough when they got knives and guns, and they murder people and rape their women. That's it, just like Muhammad, but they won't answer questions. Okay. So why do you not accept Muta? Final chance. Let's see if he's going to answer. Sorry, guys. Philip, be patient, brother. Please, be patient. Okay. Send him on his mirror. Block him. He won't answer. And this is the guy that said Muhammad Niqab. Muhammad Niqab. Yeah, destroyed me. Yeah. That's what I'll do to him and his girlfriend, Ali Dawa. By the grace of Jesus Christ. Okay. Send him on his merry way. Okay, now that said, let's focus. So do me a favor, admins. As soon as you see the Muhammad and trolls, block them, send them on their merry way. Yeah, it's Surat Nisa 424 and Surat Al Maida 587. But anyway, they won't answer because they're ashamed. All right? They won't answer because he knows I was setting them up because notice he said the Shia do it. But then you ask him, where did the Shia get it from? They got it from the Sunnah of Muhammad because even Sunnis admit that at one time Muhammad allowed prostituting, whoring women in the name of Zawaj and Muta, temporary marriage, right? But then he supposedly abrogated it. But there are other Sunni sources, as even Christian Prince noted earlier in the session, that say it was not abrogated but observed even up until the caliphate of Omar. It was Omar who then abrogated it but then reinstated it, Right? So anytime a Sunni Muhammadan condemns Shia for Muta, they don't realize in their stupidity they're condemning their prophet because he started the practice. So if you're going to condemn Shia for doing prostitution, because that's what you call Muta, you call it zinna, adultery and prostitution, you just buried your prophet because you just accused Muhammad of at one time sanctioning adultery and prostitution, and you, you say we're being destroyed and we're stupid and we're illiterate, Wow. Thank Jesus I'm not a Muslim. Thank the Lord. Okay, now, let's get back to the topic. Focus. What does it mean for someone to be called son of God? Now, the term son of God, and just again to confirm with Vine, term son of God, which can also be rendered as child of God, because son of God is not gender 
exclusive, meaning it doesn't just mean a male. Son of God is inclusive. It means males and females as children of God. So sons of God doesn't just mean males. It's inclusive term, right? It's not gender specific. Everyone with me there? Okay, so the question is, as you're paying attention, let's focus by the grace of God because I want to bless you today. I don't want to be disturbed and then disturb you. The question is, here's the question. What does it mean for someone to be called son of God? How does the Bible define the term son of God? It all depends on the context. In its most basic meaning, son of God means someone created by God, given life by God, and sustained by God. You with me there? The term son of God in its most basic meaning, not always. So don't misquote me saying, see, he, he said son of God always means this. No, it doesn't always mean <clears throat> this. In particular context, son of God refers to someone created by God, given life by God, sustained by God, <clears throat> receives provisions from God, provided by God, right? So in its most basic meaning, son of God means someone whom God has brought into being, given life to, and sustains, right? Everyone with me? Because I'm going to give you the proof of that. Did everyone get it? Focus. Don't let anyone distract you. Okay. Where am I getting this definition from? Acts 17, verse 28. Acts 17, verse 28. Not here. I'm not buffering, Tamara. You're buffering. It's clear for everyone else. Acts 17, verse 28. Read. Watch here. Probably we get close to 300. Acts 17, 28. We're just waiting for Protestant. Hopefully he hasn't left us behind. We'll probably leave him behind. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we, for we are also his offspring. So Paul is saying that all humans, because he's talking to Athenians who are not believers but steeped in idolatry, and he says even your own poets recognize we are all, we are all the offspring of God in the context of God sustaining us. That's the context. In God, we move, we live, and have our being, meaning God created us. God provides for us. He gives us life and breath. He sustains us. So in that sense, we are all sons of God, right? Now, I hope I don't need to quote Acts 17, 24 to 27 to show you. That's the meaning of offspring here. We are all God's offspring, his children, in that he created all of us, gives life to all of us, and provides for all our needs. Right? In that definition, I don't know why Mickey Afrata is putting two. In that definition, everything, everyone that God has created, that God sustains, is a child of God. Every creature that God has created, that God has given life to, that God sustains, is a child of God. Every creature. Whether spiritual or earthly, celestial, terrestrial, meaning humans and even spirit creatures, angels, in that basic definition, we're all children of God. Now, David Julius thinks he's helping me. He's not. And if David Julius quotes a passage that's not related to my answer, that defines Son of God in a different manner, which I'm about to get to, David Julius is going to get blocked. Why would you quote John 1, 12, David Julius? which is not an example of the term Son of God referring to anyone and everyone that God has created and given life to. John 1.12 speaks of those who by the grace of Christ become children of God similarly to him. Why are you trying to help me? In reality, you're not helping me. Why don't you help me by not helping me, David Julius? Right? This is what happens again when Christians chime in, trying to impress us that they know the Bible, but then giving passages that do not answer or relate to the point I'm making. 
right? John 1.12 is not an example of the term Son of God referring to all creatures being children of God by virtue of the fact that God created all <clears throat> sentient beings and gives them all life and sustains them. John 1.12 is talking about those who turn to Christ becoming sons of God in a different sense. Right? Everyone with me so far? I just want to make sure you're following with me. Help me to help you. No, KS, I'm lying through my teeth. I just gave you Acts 17.28. Talking to Athenians who are unbelievers, steeped in idolatry, and Paul says, even you are the offspring of God. Why are you the offspring of God? Because God created you, sustains you. You have your being in him. He's the source of your being and gives you all your provisions. Cloudy Kaaba Toilet. I'm going to let you answer the question. Is an antichrist a creature that God created, sustains, and gives life to? Let's see how you're going to answer the question. So answer the question, though. You say you got it. Is the Antichrist a creature that God brought into being, sustains and gives life to? So you guys are so focused on the buffering that you guys are going into tangents, not focusing. When you just told me it's okay with the buffering, but now you're complaining. I can't understand my brothers, sisters in Christ. Now, let me ask you another question. Is Satan a spirit creature that God brought into being, created, and sustains? In other words, the life that Satan enjoys is the life that God grants him, gives to him, because of God's grace. So did you see the point? The term son of God can mean and does mean a being that God has created, gives life to, and sustains. Let me show you now Luke 3, 38. If you guys don't focus and if you guys don't keep your questions relevant to the topic and go into side issues, this is going to be much longer than necessary and people are going to get disinterested and they're going to get distracted for the love of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, control yourselves. Okay? For your benefit. I know this stuff. I'm trying to help you to know it. Okay. Luke 3.38. Luke 3.38. Read. Which was the son of Enos. It's not about the genealogy. Who descended from whom. Right? Which was the son of Seth which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Okay. Seth is Adam's son because Adam begot him, right? He's his life giver, right? Right? But then it says in that same context, Adam who was the son of God, literally Adam who was of God. What does it mean that Adam is the son of God, of God? See, there's another guy who's pontificating on the term son of man, not knowing he's going to embarrass himself, Star Walker, because son of man is also used of Ezekiel, and it's used of an angelic being in Daniel. Son of man in of itself doesn't have any special connotation. It's how it's used in the context of Daniel 7. This is what happens when we get too many chiefs, not enough Indians who think they know the scriptures. You see what's sad? So what does it mean that Adam is of God, the son of God? That God created Adam, and Adam derives his life from God. But God begot Adam spiritually, not physically, because God is a spiritual being who doesn't procreate sexually or physically. But do you see that there when it says Adam of God, implied is the term son, son of God. It means 
Adam's life came from God. So in that sense, he's a son of God and God is his father. Right? Did everyone get it? So everyone got it, right? Okay. Now, when we define Son of God in that sense, meaning someone whom God created, brought into being, sustains, and gives life to, do you know that in that sense, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in that sense, can be called our Father, all three persons? And in that sense, we are all the sons of the triune God? Because if the Father gives you life, the Son gives you life, the Holy Spirit gives you life, that means, in a sense, all three of them are our Father and we are their children, but the Son and the Spirit are not the same person as God the Father. You want me there? Everyone got it? If Son of God means... A being whom God created, brought into being, sustains, gives life to, then that means we are the sons and daughters of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, because the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit gives life to all creation and sustains all creation. So in that sense, all three of them, in that sense, happen to be our Father without all of them being God the Father. This is where the modalists... Get confused. Am I making sense or am I confusing you guys? Right? So there's a sense in which the Son is our Father. There's a sense in which the Holy Spirit is our Father. If we define Father to mean the one who creates and gives life and sustains, well, the Bible says the Father creates all things, sustains and gives life to all things. The Son creates all things, sustains, and gives, gives life to all things. The Holy Spirit. So in that sense, all three of them are our Father in that sense. So all of us are their children in that sense. Right? So one definition of Son of God, one definition of Son of God is... A being whom God created, sustains, gives life to. Okay. Another definition of Son of God means someone who is called to reflect, to model, to imitate God's character. To share in God's character. To model God's character, his characteristics, his moral qualities. So a, the word son of can mean one who possesses the nature of, belongs to the category of. Are you with me there? Oftentimes, the Bible will use the term son of to mean someone who possesses the nature of that thing. Someone who belongs to the category of that thing, right? For example, the Bible will say sons of the prophets. Sons of the prophets does not mean their fathers were prophets. Sons of the prophets means they were prophets. Sons of the prophets means that they possess the characteristic of prophecy, of prophethood, i.e. they're prophets. Or the Bible says in the Old Testament, sons of the singers. That doesn't mean their fathers were singers. It means they were singers. So sons of singers means those who are singers by nature. Right? Let me show you the term son of God, meaning a person called... To reflect, to model, to imitate God's moral qualities, to share in the nature of God. Okay, Son of God means one who shares in the nature of God, albeit to a very limited extent. Right? You with me there? Before I give you the proof, so far you with me? Yeah, now let me give you the proof. Matthew 5, verse 9. Matthew 5, verse 9. 
Yep, exactly, Sargun David. Son of man means one who is human by nature, possesses the nature of man. Exactly. Matthew 5, verse 9. Belongs to the category of humanity. Exactly, Sargun. That's how we even use it in Assyrian. Barnasha, Nasha. When I say to you as an Assyrian, Barnasha, I means you're human. When I say Nasha, I mean you're human. Matthew 5, 9. Notice what Jesus says. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Literally, it's sons of God. Now, why are peacemakers called sons of God? Because God by nature is a God of peace. So when you are peaceful and create an environment of peace and bring about peace, you are a child of God in that, like your father, you possess the quality of peace. Exactly, KS. You get it? To be a peacemaker is to be like God, who's a peacemaker, who is peace. So to be a peacemaker makes you a child of God because you share in that characteristic of God. You getting it so far or you guys are going to sleep on me like... <sighs> okay. First John chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. Yep, the God of peace, Trent, Trent Mabry. Good to see you, bro. God bless you and watch over you. Good to see you. Okay. First John chapter three, verses one to three. So I'm going to show you how the Bible defines these terms. First John chapter three, verses one to three. I forgot to go to Matthew five. We'll go there in a minute. We'll go there. It's too many passages, and I'm trusting Holy Spirit to enable and recall these passages and exegete them correctly for the glory of Christ. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. Yeah. Okay, now read with me. Look what it says. Be behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed. Right? Sorry about that. Let me get this. hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what, shall, what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in himself, in him purified himself, even as he is pure. Did you catch it? To be a child of God is to be like the Father, like the Son, like the Spirit. A child of God is pure like God is, is pure like Jesus is. A child of God will share in the moral incorruptibility of God. So this is what it means to become a child of God by faith in Christ. Christ makes you children of God in that... <clears throat> The Spirit comes upon you to change you, to be like Christ in his moral perfection. To be like God in his moral perfection. And as a son of God, you share in the inheritance of the firstborn son. So let me explain what it means for a Christian to be a child of God by faith in Christ. It means now we're born of the Spirit to conform to the image of Christ. To be like Christ in his moral purity and perfection and to share in his inheritance. So in that sense, not everyone is a child of God. In that sense, not everyone is a child of God in that not everyone turns to Christ, belongs to Christ, is transformed by the Spirit to then behave like Christ and to share in the inheritance of Christ. That's only a gift given to those who believe in Christ, right? Romans 8, 29. In fact, let's read Romans 8, 14 to 18 and 29. Thank you, Trent. Romans 8, 14 to 18 and 29. So now here is a different definition, Son of God. Son of God is now being used with a different sense. In this sense, not everyone's a Son of God. Right In this sense of the term. In this sense, it refers to those who turn to Christ, born of the Spirit of Christ, born of the Spirit of the Father, Christ, to be like Christ in 
moral purity and beauty and perfection and share in the inheritance of Christ. Romans 8, 14 to 17, 18. We're going to read 18 as well. We should read all the way down, but it's okay for sake of time. And then 29. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. See? Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. That we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So notice, there is a sense in which not everyone is a son of God. What sense? Those who turn to Christ are now transformed by the Spirit to conform to the image of Christ, to behave like Christ, to act like Christ, to share in Christ's moral purity, perfection, and in his inheritance. Romans 8, 29. For whom he did foreknew, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. God bless you, Dodge. Did you catch it? Part of being a son of God in that sense is to also share in Christ physical immortality, his physical and destruction. You with me there? So to be a son of God in this sense means you are now born of the spirit of Christ, the spirit of the Father, and the spirit transforms you to now behave like Christ, act like Christ, share in his moral perfection, as well as in his physical immortality, his physical indestructibility. You with me there? So this type of son is only true of those who belong to Christ, this type of son. Let's read Romans 8, 19 to 25. To show you if you're this kind of son of God, your destiny is moral incorruption, physical immortality, physical indestructibility. You're going to be like Christ, not just in his moral nature, but in his physical being. Just like now, he's been raised physically, bodily. He's an immortal human with an indestructible physical body. That's your de destiny. You too will become morally incorruptible like him. And possess a body that's physically indestructible. Sharing in his immortality. For the earnest expectation of the creature, meaning creation. Waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. To become what they're destined to be. God is going to manifest what we are <clears throat> intended to become. What he's destined us to become. We're not there yet. Right? Guess you got to leave then if it's buffering. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him was subjected the same in hope. What hope? Because the creature, meaning creation itself, also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. That's the destiny for us and the world. This is the goal for the trees, the plants, sea life, you know, marine life, the fowls of the air, they are destined to become incorruptible when we, the sons of God, are transformed to be incorruptible. All right? 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Okay? And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, we're the first ones to be born of the Spirit, and others will follow until Christ returns. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to it, the redemption of our body. For we are saved, are saved by hope, right? We are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. If hope that's realized, it's longer hope because it's realized. What we're hoping for has come to pass. No, no longer do we need to hope for it. 
There's no need for hoping for something that's come to pass. That's what he's saying here. But hope that is seen is not hope because it's already been realized. It's come to pass. We're no longer hoping for it. We are now experiencing it, right? For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it? Is it making sense, everyone? So there is a type of sonship, type of sonship that is only true for those who belong to Christ, who believe in Christ, are united to Christ. This type of son is one who's transformed by the Spirit to become morally incorruptible, to share in Christ's moral incorruption, to become physically immortal, to possess a human nature, a physical body that's indestructible, like Christ's physical body is indestructible, and to share in the inheritance of Christ. Sent Ali Hussein to Karbala so he can cut himself and bleed to death like a good pagan, son of Satan. Right? Everyone with me? Everyone got it? Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. Galatians 4, verses 4 to 7. Now, I can go on and on and on with verse after verse after verse, but because of time, I'm wetting your appetite that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you dig deeper into the Scriptures and find these passages for yourselves. Right? Exactly, Andrew Martin. Yeah. Galatians 4, verses 4 to 7. Got to wait for our brother to post. Everyone's having a slow connection today, I guess. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, right? That we might receive the adoption of sons. Now watch here. And because you are sons, in this sense, sense that others are not, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. See? Philippians 3, 20 to 21. Philippians 3, 20 to 21. Hey, Muhammad Nikab, so we agree you and your girlfriend are going to fight me and debate me on your prophet prostituting woman. Good. Because that's the agreement you accepted. So make sure we're going to debate that your prophet prostituted woman folk like your mother before we fight and I send you to your beloved prophet, you and your girlfriend. So keep barking, boy. I know you're still upset what Christian Prince did to you. Ow, ow, ow. Anyway, I'm going to muzzle this dog in time like Jesus muzzled Muhammad. Just let's focus now. Yep. Philippians 3, 20 to 21. For our conversation, our citizenship, is in heaven. For, guys, pay attention. Is in heaven. Okay. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord, right? Look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And what will he do? Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. You see? According to the working, whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Guys, let's look at it again. Oh, yeah, I'm scared. <laughs> Not as scared as Muhammad when his soul left his body and he saw Jesus damn him to the pit of hell, which is what I'm going to do to you and your girlfriend. So keep talking tough, right? I'm scared. I see it in your eyes. I see because I see you're scared. I see it in your eyes because, you know, I know when a man is afraid because every night me and Ali Dawa. When we get very intimate for Allah, I see fear in his eye because I'm a big, ugly beast, a six foot eight Goliath. Arr! Keep barking, dog. Watch what I'm doing to you. Anyway, Philippians chapter three, 
verse 21. I'm shaking my boot, boots, can't you see? Philippians 3, 21. Okay. One more time, I want you to catch it. Don't let the children of Satan uh, disturb you. Just waiting for the verse. Sorry about that. Just waiting for the verse. Yes, you're right. I'm going to knock out your hippo prophet and his wife, Soda, who is a big fat pig, according to your Sunni sources. So, yes, I will knock him out. You're right. Philippians 3.21. Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself? Two things. Our bodies are going to be like Jesus' physical body. So here's my question to every one of you. Is Jesus' physical body indestructible and immortal? Well, yes. That means your destiny as a child of God as a child of God, your destiny will be to have a physical body that's indestructible like Christ. But then notice the second thing. Notice the second thing. It is Jesus who's going to transform all our bodies to be like his body. And it says by the power that enables him to subject everything under his feet. What kind of power must Jesus possess to be able not just to transform our physical bodies to become immortal, indestructible, but to subdue everything under his control, bring everything under his control, even Muhammad, whom he brought under his blessed feet. That's the power that only God possesses, right? That's the power that only God possesses. Clear? So in this sense of being a son of God, let me repeat again. In this sense of being a son of God, not everyone is a son of God in this manner, in this sense. This type of sonship is limited to those who turn to Christ, believe in Christ, are united to Christ by the Spirit, and then by the Spirit are transformed to share in Christ's moral incorruption and physical immortality. Right? Vine, I just answered the question. A non-elect means someone who doesn't belong to Christ. Otherwise, he wouldn't be non-elect. So how can non-elect be given immortality when the term elect refers to those who believe in Christ? You get what I'm saying, Vine? It makes no sense to speak of non-elect being given immortality in the sense that believers are given because the immortality I'm speaking of is the immortality that Christ possesses in respect to his human nature and his physical body. That type of immortality is a grace given only to the elect, those who believe in Christ. So you're going to have to define immortality for me. The way I just define immortality is to share in Christ moral incorruption and physical indestructibility. But Vine, you're using the term differently from the way I'm using it. And one thing you're going to have to learn, and I'm saying this generally, not just you, is you can't just use the term and not define it. And do not assume I'm using the term the way you're doing it because you just use the term immortality differently from the way I just use it in context. Did I just say never die, right? Or did I say a type of immortality in which we become like Christ and that we become glorified humans with a glorified physical body that's indestructible and morally incorruptible? Even those who, let's say, be tormented in hell everlastingly, because I know not everyone believes it. But let's just say you believe in everlasting conscious torment. You'd say, well, they're immortal too, not in the sense in which Jesus and his followers are. Because the immortality that Jesus possesses and confers upon us is an immortality in which we will never experience pain, suffering, or death. Not just deathlessness, but no pain, 
No suffering, no misery. Right? And where am I getting this from? Revelation 21, verses 3 and 4. So those who believe in everlasting conscious torment, yes, you can say immortal in that sense. Right? But not immortal in the sense in which Jesus and the elect will be. Christ already is, but the elect will be. Because in that sense, we're talking about a moral, incorruptible, physically indestructible life. Those will be tormented everlastingly. If that's your position, that's another topic for a future discussion. They will experience pain. They will experience suffering. In fact, they'll never experience peace, joy, love, and rest ever again. That's the polar opposite to the type of immortality, indestruct indestructibility that Jesus confers on the elect. Nothing is naturally immortal. The only being who's intrinsically naturally immortal is God. God is by nature immortal, deathless. God by nature is life. He's the necessary being that necessarily exists. Everything else has been created and given life by the creator. And that life he gives, he can take away if he wants. So we have what's called contingent immortality. Our immortality is not necessary, essential. It's the gift of his grace that he can take away if he wants. Right? Right, Brian? Everyone with me there? So I want to make sure before I move on. Vine, you got it too? So again, what you're going to learn in these sessions is we may use the same word but not define it the same way. In fact, this entire session is all about that. Son of God doesn't always have the same meaning and have the same sense, right? This is why you can't just answer a question. You have to ask the person Define their terms. What do you mean? What do you mean by immortality? Right? I'm using it in a different sense. Right? I'm talking about the type of immortality that Jesus possesses by virtue of being God, which is essential, intrinsic to his being, as well as by virtue of his humanity, which he has glorified and immortalized. Clear? Before I move on, I think I've given enough proof for this meaning of son. Right? For this meaning of son. The Bible will define the terms son of God or father in different ways, in different senses. So the context will determine in what sense is someone being called a child of God? In what sense is, is God being called their father? Yes. Yeah, it's immortality. But what kind of immortality channel? Even everlasting life for a believer isn't simply deathlessness. It is a type of life in which the person doesn't experience pain, suffering, misery, disease, sickness, but will experience perfect joy, peace, and love forever and ever. Clear? Before I move on, are you getting it, folks? Just want to make sure this is sinking in. Second Peter 1, verse 4. I have to go slow, as you can see, because it's more educational than entertaining, because I want you to understand how the Bible defines these terms. So then I can do justice to Genesis chapter 6, Job chapter 1, Job chapter 2, Job 38, as well as other references to the sons of God in the Psalms that clearly do not refer to human beings. But 2 Peter 1.4, here it is in a nutshell. 
What does it mean to be a son of God in the sense of someone who turns to Christ and believes in him? 2 Peter 1, verse 4. Here it is. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. You guys share in the nature of God. Did you know that? You partake of the, the divine nature. You bear the nature of God. What? But he explains what he means. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. This is why the early church had a concept called <clears throat> theosis. Theosis. Theosis means to be devonized, meaning Christ became man to make us God. What do they mean by God? You're not going to be almighty. You're not going to be all-knowing. You're not going to be uncreated, but you'll be, quote-unquote, God in the, sense like, in the sense that like God, You'll be morally incorruptible. Like God, you'll experience immortality and a quality of life in which you'll no longer experience pain, disease, <clears throat> hunger, you, you name it. So that's the sense in which the early church fathers understood that we would be like God. And partake of the divine nature. So when you hear Orthodox Christian talking about theosis, don't assume they're blaspheming because they're simply following what the Bible says, not like the Mormons. This is a different understanding. Human creatures becoming divine, human creatures being exalted to share in God's moral incorruptible life, being morally incorruptible and physically indestructible like the second person of the Godhead, who took on a human nature and glorified it and immortalized it. You must be one stupid, dumb person to be that stupid to think that's what the devil told Adam. But let me correct this guy. See, I'm gonna, you're going to, no, 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 don't block him because I'm going to show him why he's a moron. Come on, moron. Even before Satan told him that, did you not read in Genesis 1? That Adam is created in the image and likeness of God, you moron. Do you know what it means to be in the image of God? You who think you know the Bible, you idiot. And you wonder why I get angry with these guys who think they know the Bible. Let me show you what it means to be the image of God. And shame on you for misquoting Satan. Satan wasn't teaching this doctrine. He was teaching them to be gods, independent of God. In rebellion to God, in opposition to God. Where do you get theosis being similar to what Satan told them to do? This is why I get upset when people think they know the Bible. Come on, moron. Everyone with me there? Okay. Let's go to Ephesians 4, 24. Ephesians 4, 24. You wonder why I get upset with these guys. Ephesians 4, 24. And that ye put on and the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. That's what it means to partake of the divine nature to be in the image of God. You see it? Created after what? After God. Created in righteousness and true holiness. You're a new man created after God's image and likeness. What Satan was telling Adam and Eve to be is God's, independent of God, in opposition to God, in conflict with God, doing their own thing instead of submitting to God. How would you be that stupid to say that this doctrine is similar to what Satan was teaching them? Colossians chapter 3, verses 9 to 10.
Colossians chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. Notice Tiger Stripe just called me Muhammad's pet name and his mother's pet name because he's a dog like his prophet. Watch what I do to him, Muhammad Hijab. Keep talking. Watch what I do to him. By the power of Jesus, Muhammad's God and judge. Colossians 3, verses 9 and 10. Lie not one to another, seeing that you've put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Now, folks, do you see what being in the image of God entails? Being like God or after God's likeness entails? Being morally incorruptible like God and in the sense of what took place with Jesus in taking on a human nature that he's now immortalized, right? Glorified, becoming physically indestructible. So even before Satan had told Adam and Eve, you'll be like gods, they were already like God in one sense. Being the image bearers of God, created after the likeness of God, they were already invited to participate in God's moral incorruption and immortality. But what did they do? They wanted to be gods independently of God, in opposition to God, doing what they want, when they want it, and not submitting to God, and then they brought death. Right? So how can someone tell me? How can someone tell me? Come on, fam. That's what the devil told Adam and Eve. Really? Folks, really? Do you see why I say not every one of you? Should presume to be Bible teachers. We got too many chiefs, not enough Indians. Right? Just for the record, did everyone understand that what Satan tempted Adam and Eve to become is not the same as what the early church called theosis, which is anchored in Scripture? Already before the fall, Adam and Eve were created in the image and likeness of God, an image and likeness that entailed that they shared in God's moral incorruptibility and immortality. But they lost that by sinning. The devil's temptation wasn't you will be like God and share in God's nature. No, be your own gods doing your own thing in opposition to God. Is this what? The early church fathers were teaching, or the Orthodox Church is teaching, or these passages teaching. No, what the New Testament is teaching is a restoration of what was lost because of sin, a restoration of then sharing fully in God's moral incorruptibility and immortality. And here, don't take my word for it. Groong is an Orthodox. Everything I've said, and she will tell you, he is absolutely right. That's what we teach. And it's not her teaching. And it's not simply the teaching of the early church fathers. It's the teaching of the New Testament. Right? Come on, Sam. That's what Satan tempted Adam and Eve to do. He tempted him to, to partake in God's moral incorruptibility, immortality, he was teaching doctrine of theosis, Sam. That's the satanic doctrine, Sam. Theosis. Okay, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. Wait. So 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, where it says we're all partakers of divine nature. That's satanic. Romans 8, 29, where it says that God has destined us to conform to the image of his son. That's satanic. When Jesus will transform our bodies to be like his glorious body. That's satanic. When Ephesians 4.24 says we are being recreated, a new man, after God's likeness and holiness and righteousness, being recreated in the image of our creator, Colossians 3.10, that's satanic. And 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, where it says we are sons of God, and to be sons of God means we're going to be like Jesus, like God, in holiness and purity. That's satanic, really? See, Sam, the New Testament is teaching the satanic doctrine that Satan taught Adam and Eve, say your Bible's corrupt. <laughs> I like when I start imitating these southern preachers, right? Hey, 
exercise these exercise yes yeah, yeah, now you're gonna have some oneness anti-trinitarian heretics sons of satan are gonna take clips of me and say look look he's manifesting look because that's what one guy did look this trinitarian he's manifesting he's manifesting Right. Okay. Everyone with me so far? Vine, you got it? Okay. Do you see there's a different sense in which a person is called son of God? Okay. Now, there is another use of the term son of God that's limited to the Davidic kings. This is very important. Okay. And then we'll be ready, if I have time, to go into Genesis and Job and Psalm, or I might have to do a part two. Right? I may have to do a part two, okay? Yep, I'm, I'm shaking in my boots. That, that Robin Williams, that's right. Hey, hey, hey. All right, now, there's another sense in which Son of God is used, but it's only limited to the Davidic kings. Davidic kings. Are you ready for that? This is what I call royal sonship. Someone called to sit on God's earthly throne, ruling over God's people as God's earthly representative, and in that sense, becoming God's son in a royal sense, royal sonship. I didn't know what other term to come up with. All right? I don't know what other term to come up with. So I'm going to call it royal sonship because in one sense, all of us who belong to Christ are united to Christ. We are royal sons and daughters because we have a kingdom. So we're going to be kings and queens sharing in Christ's kingdom over creation. But this type of sonship, this type of sonship historically was limited only to David and his heirs, not to all the sons of David, but only those sons who sat on the throne in his behalf. Okay, are we ready now? Psalm chapter 2, Psalm chapter 2, verses 6 to 7. Psalm chapter 2, verses 6 to 7. Guys, pay attention and read with me. Pay attention. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree... The Lord, Yahovah, has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Did you catch it? And even Trenton anticipated this. Speaking of Israel's king who will rule in Zion, which is in Jerusalem, notice what God says. When he installs him as king, that's the day in which God says, He's my son, I'm his father. That's the day in which God says, He's my son, I'm his father. Go to Psalm 89, 19 to 20. God speaking of David, Psalm 89, 19 to 20. God speaking to David, about David and to David. Then thou spakest in vision to thy holy one and saidst, I have laid help upon one that is mighty. I have exalted one chosen out of the people. I have found David my servant with my holy oil. Have I anointed him? Okay. Speaking of David, and now God speaks about the promises about David and that he made to David. Psalm 89, 26 and 27. Psalm 89, verses 26 to 27. I don't see Muhammad Nikab here. So if he's here, let him keep barking. Watch what I'm going to do to him. By the grace of Jesus, God's uh, Muhammad's God and judge. Anyway, Psalm 89, 26 to 27. Read. Psalm 89, 26, 27. Speaking of David, folks, focus. He shall cry out unto me. David will cry out unto me. Thou art my father. My God and the rock of my salvation. Also, I will make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. Guys, did you catch it? Because David has been appointed to be God's earthly representative, sitting on God's earthly throne in Jerusalem, reigning on God's behalf as king over God's people. God says, that David is his son, and he is his father, and David is his firstborn, in the sense of God has now set David aside to sit on the throne 
and God will be the guardian of that throne, fighting David's battles on behalf of David, provided that David maintains covenant faithfulness. Is everyone getting this? I don't even see hijab. Why is that? And you guys are letting him distract you. Everyone with me? Yep, Trenton, that can be used to as well. Did everyone catch it? That the king of Israel, when he sits on the throne of Israel as God's earthly representative, becomes God's son in a special sense that doesn't apply to anyone else. And since God's throne was given to David and his heirs, that means this type of sonship is limited to only a, De a Davidite, meaning a descendant of David, who's the heir of David, to sit on David's throne. Are you getting this? Please make sure you're getting this, because I'm doing a lot of groundwork. I'm laying down a lot of foundation so we can understand, right, how the Bible defines these terms. Everyone got it? Vine, are you getting it? Just want to make sure you're getting it. First Chronicles 28, 4 to 6. First Chronicles 28, verses 4 to 6. Exactly, Mickey Afrata, you got it. Howbeit, Jehovah God of Israel chose me before all the house of my father to be king over Israel forever. Notice, did you catch it? He chose me from my father's household to be king over Israel forever. For he hath chosen Judah to be the ruler, and of the house of Judah, the house of my father. And among the sons of my father, he liked me to make me king over all Israel. And of all my sons, for Jehovah hath given me many sons. He hath chosen Solomon, my son, to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of Jehovah over Israel. And he said unto, unto me, Solomon, thy son, he shall build my house and my courts, for I've chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. Right there. I can give you more verses, but I think I made the point. There's a type of sonship limited to David and the heirs of David's throne, because the throne of David is God's earthly throne, his throne on earth in Jerusalem. So any king that sits on God's earthly throne becomes God's son in a special sense when he takes the throne to rule, a sense that is not applied to anyone else. You're getting it? Okay, now, if you're getting it, let me ask you a question. This type of sonship that I'll call royal sonship, for lack of a better term. I don't know what else to call it. Because the Bible doesn't give it a special title. Royal sonship. To be qualified for this kind of sonship, you must be a descendant of David and the heir to David's throne and begin ruling on that throne to qualify for that type of sonship. In light of that, could any son of David who wasn't the heir of the throne be that kind of son of God? Wasn't the heir. Could any other son of David who didn't take the throne of David, could he be that kind of son of God? If he wasn't the heir. Okay, good. That means you're following me. Could any Israelite who wasn't the heir of David's throne be that kind of son of God? No, medic, you're not listening. See, this is what kills me about you, medic. You don't listen. How can any son of David who's not the th heir of the throne of David be that kind of son of God? Are you even listening? Let's try it again, medic. So you're killing me, man. Been a pattern with you. You don't listen. You pretend to listen and you don't. Okay, let's try this again. First Chronicles 28, 5 to 6. He doesn't listen. He did it last time pretending to be listening. And you wonder why I say you suck as an apologist. Yep, I said that, folks. He sucks as an apologist. First Chronicles 28, 5 to 6. Let's try it again. And of all my sons, for Jehovah hath given me many sons. He hath chosen Solomon, my son. Among the many sons I have, he's chosen Solomon, my son, to
to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of Jehovah over Israel. And he said unto me, Solomon, thy son, he shall build my house and my courts, for I've chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. So now, medic, because you suck as an apologist, that's why you're going to be a medic, not an apologist. Why would you say, yes, any son of David who's not the heir of the throne can be that kind of son? We just read the passage. JC, it's interesting you said that. If you read 1 Chronicles 28, 7, their sonship is conditional upon their obedience because if they didn't obey, they'd be disqualified from being God's son in that sense, and God would then remove them from the throne. Excellent question, JC. 1 Chronicles 28, verse 7. Moreover, I will establish his kingdom forever if he be constant to do my commandments and my judgments as at this day. You see, it's conditional. You see that, JC? The promise of the throne was unconditional, meaning God gave the throne to David unconditionally. Really, Medic? No. I didn't think you're getting distracted. I know you're getting distracted, which is why stop answering if you're not paying attention. You're disrespecting the room and me. Stop, Medic. So, JC, let me answer your question more thoroughly. You're telling me to block you, brother. Please don't get me there. Now, JC, coming back to you. The throne of Israel was given to David unconditionally. You want me there? Meaning God said, the throne on earth is yours forever, unconditionally. But any one of your sons who sits on the throne will only remain on the throne on the condition they keep my promises. If not, I'll remove them and replace them with another son of yours. You with me there? Because if you're not focusing and you're inside chatter, you're going to do yourself a disservice, not understand, mis misunderstand, misquote, misinterpret, misrepresent what you heard, and distract others. Okay, is it clear for everyone, though, those who were listening, not pretending to be listening? Yes, it is on a rule. But did everyone understand the promise of the throne of Israel on earth? was unconditionally given to David. David, it's yours. There's no conditions you meet. I'm giving it to you unconditionally. But any of your sons who sit on the throne will remain on the throne provided they maintain covenant faithfulness. So that's the condition they must meet. If they fail to meet it, I will then deject them from the throne and replace them with another one of your sons. We do love them. I know I love him so much to rebuke him. It's tough love. Rajaga, wait, before I answer that question, you still don't understand what it means to partake of the nature of God and be in the image of God. Everyone understand so far? Because I want to move to the next point. So let me repeat my question. JC, why are you jumping the gun and moving ahead? Stay focused. Okay, let me repeat my question. Since this type of sonship, which I call royal sonship, right, is only given to someone who is a physical descendant of David and the appointed heir to David's throne, does this sonship apply to anyone, everyone? Can anyone be this kind of son? No, right? To be this kind of son, royal sonship, you have to be a physical descendant of David and the heir to his throne. So it's not just physical descendant of David, but the heir, the one appointed to then sit in place of David on the throne, right? First Chronicles 29, 23. First Chronicles 29, 23. Because now I'm going to repeat something I taught many moons ago in my series, Refuting 
the assertion that Jesus is the Archangel Michael. Now it's going to come back to you. We're creatures of repetition that by the grace of God, we have to hear something over and over again until it becomes second nature. But now notice again, 1 Chronicles 29 and 23. Then Solomon sat on the throne of Jehovah. So notice it's Jehovah's throne on earth as king instead of David, his father. Bam, did you catch it? Jehovah's earthly throne that belonged to David, which Solomon inherited. 1 Chronicles 29, 23, right? 2 Chronicles 9, verse 8. 2 Chronicles 9, verse 8. Jehovah's throne on earth given to David, which Solomon inherited on behalf of his father in the place of his father. Blessed be Jehovah thy God, who delighted, who delighted in thee to set thee on his throne to be king for Jehovah thy God. So on whose throne? Jehovah's throne. It's Jehovah's throne. So Jehovah at that time in history had two thrones, one in heaven, one on earth. The one in heaven he occupied, the one on earth David and his heirs occupied. You see it? Blessed be Jehovah thy God, which delight in thee. This is the queen of Sheba speaking to Solomon. Jehovah delighted in you, Solomon, to set thee on his throne to be king for Jehovah thy God, because thy God loved Israel to establish them forever. Therefore made he thee king over them to do judgment and justice. Hope it's sinking in. Okay. Second Chronicles 13 verse 8. Second Chronicles 13 verse 8. And now ye think to withstand the kingdom of Jehovah in the hand of the sons of David. There you go. In the hand of the sons of David. And ye be a great multitude. And there are with you golden calves which Jer Jeroboam made you for gods. Second Chronicles 21 verse 7. Yep, Billy Mandalay. The earthly reign is supposed to emulate the heavenly reign. You see what it means again? To be a royal son of God, it's not just, Billy, you rule on God's behalf on earth, but your rule has to model God's rule in heaven. You get it? So part and parcel even of this type of sonship, right? Even this type of sonship entails the necessity to model your rule after God's rule. You reign on earth the way God reigns in heaven. You imitate God's rule in heaven. You get it, everyone? Vine, everyone? Andrew, everyone? First Chronicles 21, 7. Howbeit the Lord would not destroy the house of David because of the covenant that he had made with David. See, it's unconditional. The covenant he had made with David, and as he promised to give a light to him and his sons forever. It's an unconditional promise. So though God would punish the unrighteous kings of Judah, though they're sons of David, he wouldn't wipe out the kingdom altogether because he promised David unconditionally. This is your throne forever. I will not go back on my promise. You with me there? Is it clear it's sinking in? Why do you think Angel Gabriel said the following to the Blessed Mother of our Lord? Luke 1, 32 to 33. Luke 1, 32 to 33. He shall be great. Jesus will be great shall be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. Why is it called the throne of David, his father? Because that's what it is. So though it's Jehovah's throne, it was given to David as his possession. So you can talk about the throne on earth, the throne in Jerusalem as the throne of Jehovah and or the throne of David. So here Jesus Christ is said, to possess the throne of his father, David. Right? And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Yes, Mickey Ephrata, you got it. 
in more than one sense. You said three senses, but actually at least two. But you can argue three senses. Right? Let me explain what I mean. Jesus is God's son in three senses. There's a sense in which he's the eternal son who's always existed with the father. And he is the one who made the father what he is. It's his sonship that makes God the father and eternally so. So he's the son in eternity that made God the father by nature in eternity who shares fully in the nature of his father, one with him in essence. That's one sense. Then he's the son of God in the same sense that Adam is. Like Adam was given life directly from God, created from the dust, and had God breathed the breath of life in his nostrils, Jesus also is God's son in that sense. When God caused Mary to conceive the physical body, the human nature of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit, so he becomes the son of God in the sense that Adam was God's son. And then there's the other sense. He is a royal son of God. In that, he becomes a physical descendant of David to become the heir of David's throne. And when he sits on that throne as David's heir and representative, he becomes the son of God in that sense. You see? Everyone getting it? Who cares if my voice is 20 seconds late, as long as you're hearing it? So is everyone learning a vitally important fact of Scripture? The term Son of God doesn't always have the same meaning. So you can't tell me Son of God means this. Okay? So Jesus is the eternal Son of God. The son who makes God the father by nature. So he is the son who existed in eternity before creation. And its sonship is what makes God the father by nature. The eternal son, always existing with the father. And possesses the fullness of the divine essence. Right? He shares in his father's essence fully, completely, eternally. So he is the only son of that kind. Right? There's only one son of that kind. He's also the son of God in the same way that Adam is God's son in that like Adam, right, was created from virgin soil, was born out of virgin soil that was watered by a mist, fashioned by Jehovah, and then God breathed the breath of life in his nostrils, made him a living soul. Similarly, the second Adam, the last Adam, came out of virgin soil, the virgin womb of the Virgin Mary by the Holy Spirit, right? So in that sense... He's like Adam was in respect to being a son of God in the sense that Adam was God's son. But then the third sense is he becomes a physical descendant of David to, becomes, to become David's heir, taking the throne and ruling on the throne on behalf of David as David's heir, representative, and son. So then he becomes a royal son in that sense, like the Davidic heirs were sons of God in a royal sense. Right? I don't know why the admins let these Mohammedans bark and do nothing. They just let them sitting there. What's going on with your admins? Everyone got it or no? Before I move on. So before Jesus became flesh, vine and everyone else, before Jesus became flesh, was he a royal son of God? Remember how I defined royal sonship? A physical descendant of David, who's the heir of David's throne, who reigns on David's throne, and when he reigns on the throne of David, he becomes God's son in a royal sense. Before Jesus became flesh, was he a royal son of God? See, JC is not paying attention. And it's upsetting me that JC is not paying attention. John McDermott is not paying attention. John, how can Jesus be the royal son of God before he became flesh? 
When to be a son of God in that sense, you have to be a physical descent of David. What are you guys smoking? Sell me some. You make a lot of money in Colorado. What are you guys talking about? Let me try this again. Stop pretending to be paying attention and understanding. Okay, let's try this again. Was Jesus a royal son of God before he became flesh? And I define what royal son means. A physical descendant of David appointed to be David's heir sitting on David's throne. Why would you guys tell me yes when he wasn't a physical son of David before he became flesh? What do you guys smoke and sell it? You'll make millions. So why, John and JC, you said yes? Why? Are you really paying attention or you're wasting your time and mine? Huh? So I want to ask it a third time. Stop pretending you're listening. If you're not, be silent. Was Jesus the royal son of God before he became flesh? If we define royal sonship to me, a physical descendant of David who's appointed to be the heir of David to sit on David's throne. Now, I know Michael Vidvilas did not make the mistake of asking me the question of how Jesus could be the son of David when he's David's Lord. I know that person didn't ask me that question right now. I know I'm just imagining things. So, Raul, before he became a descendant of David, are you, do you understand English, Raul, or is it not your mother tongue? Before Jesus took flesh from Mary and became a physical descendant of David, was he God's royal son? See, I don't know why it's taking longer than normal to understand a basic question when the answer is very simple. Don't complicate things, folks. Don't. Don't make things harder than what they are. But I have to ask and interact because I have to make sure you're getting it or it defeats the purpose. When would Jesus qualify for that kind of sonship? When would Jesus qualify to become a royal son of God? When would Jesus qualify for that kind of sonship? When would Jesus qualify for that kind of sonship? After his birth, incarnation, right? Okay. But what if he was born from the tribe of Levi? Or what was he born from another member of the household of Judah, not from David's household? Would he then have qualified? If he wasn't a physical descendant of David. So he became qualified when he became flesh and became a physical descendant of David. He had to be not just flesh, a human being, but a human being from the line of David, a physical descendant of David. Why do you think the New Testament writers go out of their way to say Jesus is of the seed of David according to the flesh? And according to David's physical body, the Christ came. Or from the household of David or the son of David. For example, Romans 1 verse 3. Romans 1 verse 3. Watch here. Because I'm setting it up for the Genesis passage and Job and Psalm. Romans 1, 3. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Made of the seed of David. See, it's in his flesh he's a seed of David. In his physical body, his human nature, he's a seed of David. Well, why did he become a seed of David? To fulfill the promises of David. 
to inherit the promises of David, to consummate the promises of David. Acts 13, 22 to 23. And we, when he had removed him, Saul, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony, said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. From this man's physical seed, he raised up Jesus. Acts 2, 29 to 31. Acts 2, 29 to 31. Is this really Muhammad Hijab or is this guy playing, pulling my leg? Is this one of these fake Knicks pretending to be a Muhammad Hijab? No, it can't be him. He just said something nice. It's impossible. Hold on, hold on. Don't block him. No, it's impossible. There's no way Muhammad Hijab could say something nice to me that I lost weight. <laughs> That's impossible, dude. Seriously? Because there was someone hacking. Hacking his account. It's him? No, it's all fake. I thought, yeah. It okay. No, it's not you. I can't believe it. Impossible, Muhammad Hijab. There's no way you'd come in here and say something nice to me. Come on, dude. You know you're kidding. Anyway. Well, anyway, if it's him, welcome. You can still listen. Just please, Muhammad Hijab, don't take any shots. I won't take any 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 shots. Yeah, well, for you to say I lost weight, that's amazing because your other Muslim friends on your Twitter account were saying, yeah, Sam's a fat – he's a fat blob. Hey, Muhammad, I don't know if you can put a chokehold on him with that fat head of his. All right, anyway. No, it's not him. See, he's lying. Okay. All right, if it's him – Leave him be. Don't block him. Leave him be. Don't block him. Listen what I'm saying. Don't block him. Leave him be. Let him listen as long as he doesn't attack and mock. All right? Okay. Let's pay attention. As long as there's no mocking or attacking or ridiculing, you can stay. Any Muslim can stay. Don't mock. Don't attack. Don't ridicule. Because then don't blame me when I give you a taste of your medicine. Okay. Focus. Welcome, Muhammad Hijab. Stick around. You can listen. If you have questions, you can ask me. Nobody called your mom a prostitute, dude. Come on. Okay, focus, focus, guys. Don't get into side talk. I just, look what I just said. Guys, don't attack anyone. Let's be courteous. If they're not going to attack, and I said they're not going to attack, they're like, Dodge and guys, which part of don't attack Muhammad Hijab wasn't clear? Leave the guy alone if he's not gonna attack, if he's not gonna mock, if he's not gonna insult, leave him alone so we can focus. He's more than welcome to sit here and learn and listen and even ask me questions. You can even ask me questions, Hijab. I'll try to answer. No insults, no mocking our faith, our God, or us, and we will. Respond in kind. So now, Christians, please don't attack. Leave him alone, please, so I can finish the topic. Please respect me. Don't, as long as he's not attacking, leave him be. If it's really him. Okay, anyway. All right, let's focus now. Let's focus. Yep. Make sure you accept the, the challenge. Good job. You and Ali, it's all out. No rules. When I say no rules, anything goes. I'm not kidding. Anything goes. And we're going to have our debate first, Muhammad Hijab. We're going to debate first on Muta. Then we're going to have the fight so I can put the icing on the cake. So you accepted to my challenges, buddy. You accepted them. I put them there for everyone to see. You agreed. You and Ali, both of you, one-on-one, -on -one, we're going to fight. And we're going to have a debate on Muta. You agreed. You're not running and backing down, Muhammad Hijab. You agreed. I put it there. So, al Masih Akbar! All right, let's focus now. Okay. Guys, he agreed. 
I'm going to take him out and his boy out. No holes barred. Anything goes. And he doesn't understand what I mean by anything. But we're going to have a debate on Muhammad and Muta first. And he agreed. You guys got on record. We're debating Muta and his prophet. And then the fight to put the icing on the cake to send them on their merry way. And Masih Akbar. So you better make sure you stipulate all that you agree to every demand. Okay, now let's focus, folks. Yep. Watch what I'm going to do to this guy. Theologically, spiritually, and physically. Anyway. Let's focus. Acts 2, 29 to 31. No, they're not going to scream with me. They can't play that game with me. I'm Middle Eastern. The guy doesn't know what he just did. Acts 2, 29 to 31. Let's read. Focus, guys. No side distraction. Focus, please. Please focus. Acts 2, 29 to 31. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. Please, in Jesus' name, focus. That he's both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, God had sworn to David, that of the fruit of his loins, meaning from his physical body, his lineage, physical lineage, according to the flesh again, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Did you catch it? Christ comes from the flesh of David, according to Christ's flesh. He's from the loins of David. Here is the Christ from the seed of David, according to the flesh. He's from the physical loins of David, according to the flesh. Notice the repeated emphasis, flesh, flesh, flesh. And I'll explain the significance in a moment. Let's read verse 31. He's seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. Now, folks. Do you see why the New Testament writers are constantly hammering that Jesus is the seed of David from the physical loins of David according to the flesh, according to the flesh, according to the flesh? I just told people not to antagonize Muhammad Ajanab, and even one of my admins, Protestant believer, can't control himself. Why do you think it keeps saying according to the flesh, according to the flesh? Why is it emphasizing that Jesus is the seed of David from the loins of David according to the flesh? According to the flesh. Anas, if you want to stick around, don't mock. We won't mock. Listen, please, no mocking, because then I'm going to have to mock back. Do you know why? According to the flesh. Okay, this is, I'm going to block you. You know that, right? I'm going to block everyone who keeps ignoring me. Tis that you need to go. Send this out of here, please. Send this out of here. Because Jesus has two natures. That's why they keep saying according to the flesh. Because he's the son of God who is God by nature. But in his humanity, according to the flesh, he's of David. This is why it keeps hammering the point. According to the flesh. According to the flesh. Because Jesus has two natures. One of which is not flesh, it's divine. This is what I wanted you to see. No, I'm actually, I'm going to de demolish your boy and his girlfriend. You keep talking smack. Send this guy on his merry way too. Everyone with me there? Everyone with me there? According to the flesh, why? Because Jesus has two natures. He's not just flesh. He's, he's more than flesh. But in respect to the flesh, he's of the seed of David. Okay. Send John on his merry way. Okay, sorry. I was buffering. Like I said, anyone who continues to disrespect my wish not to mock has got to go. I said it several times and you keep disrespecting me. It's not the Muslims you're disrespecting, you're disrespecting me. Okay. Now, for Jesus to qualify for this type of sonship, a royal son, first he has to be a physical descendant of David. That's what he became. When he was born of Mary and took on flesh from Mary, because Mary's from the household of David, 
So when he was born of Mary, he became a physical descendant of David according to his flesh. Okay. Now, that part of the requirement for royal sonship, he realized, right? <clears throat> but when does he actually become a royal son? When he then sits on the throne. Sure, Orthodox believer. I even have Nate, a former UFC fighter. Nate, he's a born-again Christian from Colorado. He's a former UFC fighter. Watch what I'm going to do to this guy. Just wait. But now, he's a physical descendant of David, number one. But for him to become the royal son of God, he then has to take the throne, sit on the throne, and rule on behalf of David. That's when he becomes the royal son of God. Everyone with me there? Send Brolius out of here. Yeah, it is Nate Diaz, sort of truth. Nate Diaz, I met him in Colorado. He's a committed Bible-believing, born-again Christian. Good friend of mine. So watch him do to this guy. Just wait. By the grace of God, if it comes through, if him and I want both of them, not just him, both of them. Him and Ali. No, he's not in California, Muhammad. He's somewhere else, but I'm not going to tell you where. That's between him and I. Make sure Ali also agrees. It's going to be you and him. We're both going to have it on, one-on-one. -on -one. I'm not kidding. I want him and you in the debate, in the fight. So let's see if you're all talk or you're going to come through. Okay. Now, folks, let me repeat the question. Let me repeat the question. Jesus becomes a physical descendant of David. So that part of the requirement he meets. But for him to become the royal son of God, it's not simply he's a physical descendant of David. He then must take the throne as David's heir. That's when he becomes the son of God. So here's my question. When did Jesus become the royal son of God exactly? When? When? Folks, this is going to be the final time I'm going to say this. If you keep interacting with Muhammad Hijab, I'm going to start blocking you. Make my day. I'm going to start blocking you because you guys are not listening. When did he become the royal son of David? I know it's when he sits on a throne. When did that happen? When did that happen? No, it's going to be later than January 19, buddy. Closer to the end of the year. With the debates. I'll do it January 19 if you agree, Muhammad Hijab. Will you debate me on 17 on Muhammad and Muta? Because I got to get in fighting shape to take you out. Because I'm going to take you out, buddy. And believe me, you're not going to be in Jannah with no hoodies. That's a promise. And by the way, just so I can get you on record. So you do agree. We're debating Muta and your prophet, you and Ali, and then you do agree it's going to be me and you one day and then me and Ali in a fight the next day, right? Now, I want you to agree to my conditions. Hold on, folks, because he's going to distract me here. We're going to know. We're going to have a live moderated debate like you did with David Wood. No, 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 no. You're not going to run, my friend, but here. So I want you to type it in because we're going to screenshot it. You accept my challenge. I'm going to debate you. And Ali Dawa on Muhammad and Muta. It's going to be a moderated debate like you did with David Wood. So you can tell me that Eliyahu means God is with us and that your, your God does Salah for, not to, Muhammad. So you're going to say, yes, I agree. And you're agreeing. You and me are going to fight. No holds barred. And me and Ali will fight. Put in the text, yes, I agree to all that. Put it now. I want to record it. And we're going to take a snapshot, a screenshot, and post it on social media. Do you accept all my challenges to your challenge? You're going to have to do it. Do you accept? Because we're icing time here. Huh? Hold on.
So I can school this kid and take him out because he thinks he's 6'8 and he's going to scare people. That's what he thinks because he's 6'8 and he's, he's going to scare people. The guy don't know, know me or where I'm from. No, 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 no. You didn't hear what I said. You and Ali were going to fight. He has to fight me too. Do you accept your messenger, your messenger boy? He's not going to hide behind your niqab. I'm sorry. Yes, baby. You sure? Guys, screenshot it. Screenshot it. Him and Ali have agreed they're going to fight with me. Yeah, baby. And you agree we're going to debate Muhammad and Muta, right? Professional debate? No, no, wait, wait, wait. I'm going to there. You agree we're going to debate Muhammad and Muta. Professional debate? You and Ali and me. No, 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 no. You're not going to tap dance. I know you're afraid to defend your prophet. I'd be afraid too. You're going to say it here in front of everyone. Me and Ali agree we're going to have a professional debate like I did with David Wood, but Ali's going to help me because I'm going to need all the help I can get because not even Allah and his messenger can help me. We're going to debate Muhammad and Muta. Professional debate. Yes or no? I promise you I'm going to take you out in the fight. That's my promise to you and Allah. Yes, so you're going to debate Muta. Yes, baby. Screenshot that. Now we're going to have to agree on when it's going to happen. The fight first or the debate. Guy screenshot it. He agreed to all the conditions. We're going to talk about what's going to come first and when. But I got you now, baby. al Masihu Akbar! Thank you, buddy. And you're going to come to America and do it. I'm going to call Nate. We're going to set it up. We're going to get ready. Thank you. al Masihu Akbar! Jesus, the God of Muhammad! Who brought Muhammad under his feet, you will be glorified. Now let's get back to the topic. Now, Muhammad, go back and make some more videos slandering Christian Prince, taking him out of context because he's got to focus now. Friend, you're coming to America like you did for David Wood. You're coming to America. You can afford it with all the mega bucks that you be making and collecting. And then your advertisement, you seen that advertisement for that bottle? Yes, brother, brothers. Make sure you buy this product. I said, I can't imitate him, but I can do Zachary Knight. The Zachariah version of Muhammad Ajah. Uh, this right here, if you buy it right now, you will get 50% off. And all the proceeds will go for Dawah. And we're going to give for the orphanage. And we're going to help with the Shia brother to stop doing Muta. Allahu okay. Akbar. All right, now. We'll be in negotiations for your slaughter and demise by the grace of Jesus. All right. Guys, let's focus now. Let's focus. Let's focus. I want to smash you more than you want to smash me intellectually and physically. I'm going to do to you what Jesus did to your prophet. I promise you. Okay. okay. Now, now, Mama, do me a favor, man. I want to focus on the session. We're wasting time. Can we now stop? Because I need to focus now. Because I don't want to block you, bro. Jesus was the God of Muhammad and buried Muhammad under his feet. You want to debate that too? You and Ali, we debate whether Jesus is God. You want to debate that too? Yes or no? Two debates? Muhammad and Mutan, Jesus, the God of Muhammad? Come on, quickly. What January 11, dude? We're going to talk about the dates and when. All right, now, Muhammad, we'll talk about it now. I ain't got time to waste the time. Guys, sorry for wasting time. Okay, I just time it up. Okay, Mom, we're going to talk, but you, we got you screenshot. You and your messenger boy, we're going to debate and have physical altercation. No holds barred. So I can put the icing and cake and present you as Zabi Hamid to Allah and his messenger. Okay, now let's let's focus, guys. Let's focus. Sorry. Sorry for distraction. It's been a heck of a day. Satan's attacking over and over again because this guy thinks he's 6'8". He's going to scare people. He doesn't know what I'm going to do to him. He's going to be crying, Mommy, Mommy. Allah's not helping me. Can you help me? Allah Akbar. Can you get me a woman so I can suck on her breast? Allah Akbar. All right, anyway, I got to stop. All right. Let's stop. Okay, let's focus, guys. Sorry for the distraction. Today was one heck of a day. Do you guys want me to continue or do you want me to just call it a day?
As you can see, there's fear in my eyes, brother. There's fear in my eyes. I'm scared. I'm shaking. Woo. I fear in my eyes. I'm shaking. You want me to finish or you guys are tired of this? Because I've kept you for very long. Yeah, do you want me to finish this point or should I just close it? Yeah, I'm not going to get to Nephilim today. Too many distractions. Put a one if you want me to finish it. One. Yeah, this was active. Boy, was it active. You see, Vine, an important subject for you, and you see the distractions one after the other. But, Vine, I hope it didn't discourage you. You're still following me, Vine. Are you still following me? Do you want to make sure Vine's getting it? I was doing it for Vine and Andrew and others. Sorry for all the distractions. Sorry for all the side talks. Sorry for all the satanic nuisances. I try my best to rein it in, but you can see even I got carried away. All right. Now, I don't know if Vine is here. I didn't know what his response was. Okay. So Royal Sonship. Let me finish it with Royal Sonship. Royal Sonship is this. Is what Royal Sonship is. You got to be a physical descendant of David and the heir of David's throne. So you're born from David's line physically, and then you inherit the throne on David's behalf. Jesus, when he was born of the Virgin Mary, qualified in the sense that he became a physical descendant of David. According to his human nature, his flesh, he became of the seed of David. So he met that qualification. But then to become the royal son of God, he would then have to reign on the throne as David's heir. So my question again was, when did David, when did Jesus reign on the throne as David's heir, thereby becoming God's royal son? Let me repeat again. When did Jesus rule on the throne as the physical heir of David, thereby becoming God's royal son? Roscoe got it. When he went to heaven after the resurrection and sat on the throne. With that said, Hebrews 1, 3 to 5. Hebrews 1, 3 to 5. Hebrews 1, 3 to 5. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. Pay attention, Hebrews 1, 3 to 5. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, he sat on the right hand of the majesty on high, then he became better than the angels, and he asked by inheritance, obtain a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Guess what passages Hebrews 1.5 just quoted? In Hebrews 1.5, he quoted Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, and he quoted 1 Chronicles 17, verse 13. And he says, God never said to any angel, you are my son, today I've begotten you. I will be his father, he'll be my son. But he did say that to Jesus when Jesus ascended into heaven to become positionally better than the angels and sit on the throne. That's when these promises were fulfilled in Jesus. Did you catch it? So the promises of David and the heirs of David to the throne, that they would be God's sons when they sat on the throne of God on earth, Jesus fulfilled when he went to heaven and sat on the throne as the son of David. Everyone got it? Vine, I hope you're here. You're getting it. How about you, Andrew? Andrew Martin? Sixteen eleven. you're following with me too, besides all distractions? Sorry about that. A lot of distractions today. Forgive me. God willing, I'm going to have to rein it in and do a better job of controlling the situation by the power of the Holy Spirit. I think Vine left. But anyway, I don't know if Andrew Martin left. Okay. So what's the point? Here, Jesus becomes the royal son of David. But here's the problem though, folks. That's okay, brother. It says, to which of the angels did God ever say, 
You are my son today. I've begotten you. Answer, he never said that to any angel. Never said that to any angel. Or I will be his father. I'll become his father. He'll be my son. I'll be a father to him. He'll be a son to me. The answer is God never said it to any angel. Okay. But now here's the problem though. If God never said to an angel, you're my son today, I've begotten you. Then what do we do with those passages in the Old Testament where angels are called sons of God? This goes back to the point I was making at the beginning. What do we do with those passages where angels are called sons of God? Here it says, God never said to any angel that an angel is a son whom he begot spiritually. Absa, David is a created being. Yes, angels are called sons of God in several places of the Old Testament, which is what I was preparing you guys for. All of this was preparatory for what's to come, God willing, tomorrow. No, Roscoe. Pins and needles, needles and pins. A happy man is a man that grins. You can talk about begetting someone, and you can talk about creating someone. Those terms are used often interchangeably. How can angels be called sons of God? And yet, here Hebrew says, he never said to any angel, you're my son, I've begotten you. I'll be his father, he'll be my son. Because you missed the entire point of the session and Mickey Ifrata got it. It's going to be in America, but it's going to be later in January. It's going to be near the end of the year. So we're going to talk about the date for your slaughter, I promise you. The debates and me physically decimating you and your messenger. I promise you, we're gonna we're gonna work it out closer to the end of the year, friend. Because I'm gonna go into tense training to take you out. No, no, it's not too lo too long. I'm gonna make sure I'm gonna be in fighting shape because I'm gonna hurt you real bad, and that's a promise. I I promise you. Make sure you grow a couple more inches when I take you out. Oh, I, you you can keep laughing. You can laugh all you want. <clears throat> I was going to say, I'm, I can't say mom because mom's a false prophet. But anyway, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. Why don't you do this? Come meet me in the street. Attack me because when I put you in a coma, it's going to be self-defense because you're going to be attacking me. So if you're really a man and you're not like your prophet and you're a man, come to America. Attack me in the street. No, 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 no I'm going to say. I'm going to call him out. Attack me in the street. So I'll call it self-defense. I promise you, you don't have the courage to attack me in the street. You and your messenger boy, I promise you, I promise you, you are not a man to attack me physically because it's going to be self-defense. And I promise you, if I see you and you do something, I guarantee you, just like Jesus took Muhammad's life, I'm going to have to put you in a coma because that's self-defense because you're going to be attacking me. You're threatening my life. But you're not a man. You're not going to do it, Muhammad Ijab. You're just like this, just like your prophet used to hide behind jihadis. So keep. Running your mouth, watch what it do to you. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm squirming all right. I'm squirming. We'll see. Yeah, he fought behind Aisha's murt in her dress because that was the only time why he would come down to him when your prophet was in your when his child bride's dress. That's when he fought. Mm -hmm. Okay, now let's let's talk about the subject. Okay, now for the rest of you. No, I can't fight. I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm scared of jihadi hijab. Muhammad Nikam. Yeah, okay. Keep talking, dude. Just keep talking and barking, brother. Just go ahead. That's all you can do. Focus with me, folks. Let's go back to the answer. Let's go. Come to America and you have here. Guys, I'm saying it. If he wants to do it real fast, here, it's on record. Come to America. I'll tell you where I'm at. Attack me physically and see what's going to happen to you. But you're not going to do it. You're not a man. You're not going to do it. You're going to do it in the ring. We're going to set up a date. You want to be training because then I'm going to hurt you real bad in the ring, you and your messenger boy. But you're not a man, Muhammad Hijab. You know you're not. I'm calling you out. You know you're not. Confirm your flight. Come to the state of Arizona. Confirm it. And I'll give you the location because that means you're coming to attack me physically. And I promise you, Allah's not going to save you. Yep. Come to Arizona. Tough guy. I just gave you location. Let's see if you're a man. 
unlike your prophet, book the flight, come to the state, and come and attack me. No, I'm talking about attack me physically in the street. Anyway, muzzle this guy. This guy's another joke. He's acting tough for his fan base because he knows I'm going to hurt him bad. Send this guy on his merry way. Make sure you smooch, smooch the black stone. Smoochy, smoochy. Anyway, guys, let's come back. Guy knows better. He, he won't do it. He's all talk. Okay, you guys ready now? Why not? Why? I'm going to hide Arizona. And? Support, I'm not like you. I'm not scared. If I was scared, I wouldn't show my face on screen. What is all right? Anyway, let's 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 focus. Yeah, don't worry about it. The guys talk, I promise you. If a guy attacks me, uh, he's gonna get hurt bad. I promise you. The guy doesn't know me. It's okay, let him talk. Guys, let him talk. I just wanted to call out his bluff and expose him here. Problem is, man, I gave my location not to him. I don't care. I gave it to him, but to other people. All right? That's all right. That's okay. There were certain other people I didn't want them to know, but hey, that's fine. All right. I'm just thinking. That's okay. All right. Folks, should I do another session on this? Start over again tomorrow? There was too many distractions. I think I'm going to do it. I'm going to delete this and do it tomorrow. Okay. But let me just finish the point, and tomorrow we're going to do another fresh session because there's too many distractions. Okay? I don't know. But you guys got the screenshots, right? That he agreed? All right. Okay. All right, man. Anyway, let's finish this. The reason why there's no contradiction, let's, let's go back. Okay. Okay, I'll leave it. Sorry, man. So I really want to apologize to every one of you for the distractions. I really do. Sorry. I really apologize for the distractions. Really bad day today. The reason why God didn't say to any angel, you are my son today, I've begotten you. Let me explain. Let's get the point. Okay. Let me explain. Let's get the point so I can prepare for tomorrow. Okay, I won't delete it then. Okay, I won't. Because I don't want to be distracted by these Mohammedans. Sorry about that. I apologize to you guys. Okay. No, it has nothing to do with spiritual creatures. It has to do with Mickey Ephrata, what he said. Do you guys pay attention at the beginning when I said the term son of God can mean different things in different contexts? Can mean different things in different contexts? Do you remember that? Okay. I said son of God can mean this or can mean that. In Hebrews 1, what type of sonship does the author of Hebrews have in mind? What type of sonship does the author of Hebrews have in mind? Okay, this is the type of sonship he has in mind. Okay. Royal, royal sonship. But to qualify for royal sonship, you have to be a physical human descendant of David and take the throne on behalf of David as his physical son. Of course, God. Sorry about that. I, I was buffering. Of course, God, of course, God would not say to any angel, you're my son in that sense, because no angel qualifies to be that kind of son of God. Royal sonship is only applicable to a physical descendant of David who sits on the throne on David's behalf as his physical seed. How can God call any angel his son in that sense when no angel is a physical descendant of David and the heir to David's throne? That's why there's no contradiction. You can be a son of God in one sense and not be a son of God in another sense. So angels are God's sons in a different sense from the way David and his heirs are sons of God. There is no contradiction if you understand the differences in the meanings of the term Son of God. That was the point I was trying to make at the beginning. You remember? You remember? So, yes, God never said to an angel, you are my son in the sense that David and his heirs are my sons. The heirs 
of my earthly throne on earth in Jerusalem, which I gave to David and his physical descendants. You angels cannot be my son in that sense because none of you are human. None of you are physical descendants of David and none of you inherit the throne of David. So how can I call you my son in that sense? Right? You with me? But this also tells us Jesus can't be a mere created angel, an angelic creature, because God never appointed an angelic creature, a spirit creature, to be a son of David and the heir of David. God never appointed an angelic creature to become a physical descendant of David to inherit the throne of David to rule on David's behalf. So this shows not only are angelic creatures not God's royal sons, but Jesus can't be a mere spirit creature, an angelic creature, because he is a royal son of David, something that's not true of angelic creatures. Making sense? Claudia, you still don't get it. See, JW would disagree. Okay. Claudia, let's try this again because it means you're not listening. I don't care if they would disagree. If they disagree, that means Hebrews is wrong because God did say to an angel, You are my son, today I've begotten you, which means they've turned the argument of Hebrews upside down on its head. What in the world are you talking about? No, it's not all good, Claudia. I'm going to block you because it's not all good. You throw things and then you run away like a coward. No, it's not all good. I don't care if JWs don't agree, Cloudy. For them to disagree means that Hebrews is wrong because God did say to an angel, angelic creature, according to them, you are my son today, I've begotten you. You don't get it? You don't get it? So if they disagree, that means Hebrews is wrong. Because according to them, God did say to an angelic creature, you are my son, today I've begotten you. He did appoint an angelic creature to be the heir of David. But the point of Hebrews is he didn't do that for any angelic creature. What are you not getting? What are you not getting? Keep throwing out these things that you think are helping you, and you're not going to last here. And it's not even in these last days. These last days began 2,000 years ago with the coming of the Messiah. Is that clear to everyone else? Sorry, guys. It was a very rough session, a chaotic session, and a confusing session because of all the distractions. By the power of Jesus Christ, we're going to rein it in. We're not going to allow these distractions in Jesus' name. And the admins are going to start now just blocking people left and right who come and attack and distract. Right? Cloudy, God bless you. Huh? Take care. Hold on. Okay. Folks, again, my apologies to every one of you. I hope the distractions weren't too much of an issue and it didn't anger you and make you lose focus. My apologies because we kept getting attacked by Muslims and supposedly that was Muhammad Hijab. Many confirmed that was actually Muhammad Hijab. That was actually him. That's good. We got him on record. I'm going to get him in Jesus' name by the grace of God in time. But now coming back to you, even though it was a distraction, I hope it was still clear enough that you got the meat of the session. Son of God can mean different things in different contexts. Did you at least get that? All right. Forgive me for distractions. Keep praying, folks. As you can see, the demons of Islam, the dogs of Muhammad, the children of Satan are out. They're angry. They're vicious. They're manifesting. Because we are disgracing their prophet by the power of Jesus, and they don't like it. They're starting manifest after what Christian Prince did. Pray hard for us that we're covered by the blood of Jesus, sealed by the Spirit, surrounded with the armies of heaven, bold as lions, 
to the point of death for the glory of Christ. Right? So I'll see you guys tomorrow, Lord willing. Christ is risen, risen indeed. We're going to talk about the sons of God in Job, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 8, and in Genesis 6 as well, Psalm 89 and Psalm 29. God willing, see you guys tomorrow, right? Still triggered. Stay triggered? Okay, yeah, you want me to start chewing people? All right. <laughs> All right, God bless you. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Oh, that's right.